Hello and welcome to Living Word, growing a family that experiences every promise of God. You're listening to another life-changing word from Pastor Jason Anderson. For more information, visit our website at livingwordonline.com. Today I want to go to 1 Samuel in chapter 17, and I want to share with you on David a little bit. David had just defeated a great giant. The Bible says that with a sling and a stone, he slung a stone at the giant, and it hit him in his forehead, and it sunk into his head, and the giant Goliath fell down, face first, dead. And our warrior David did not have a sword with him for battle. Instead, he had a shepherd's staff. And so he walked over to the enemy Goliath, and he took the enemy's sword, and he used that sword to cut off the head of the giant. The Bible goes on to say that he took that head and carried it around with him. This giant, the Bible goes through great lengths to explain how big he really was. Six cubits and a span, it says, which is about nine feet, nine inches tall. He had a coat of armor on him. Just the coat itself weighed 125 pounds. It was made of bronze. His spear, it talks about the javelin of Goliath, had a head on it that was 15 pounds made of bronze. He wore a bronze helmet. He wore bronze armor all over. He was a massive person. And David began to carry around the head of the giant. The Bible even says that David was sent for by Saul. Saul said, go get that boy. And, the, and David, when he showed up, was still carrying the head of Goliath as he talked to Saul. We look at the scripture here, it says this, And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. What are you doing, David? David does not live in Jerusalem. And so he went on a little journey by himself, carrying the noggin of the defeated foe, Goliath, to Jerusalem, which is odd. Somebody might even take the time to calculate the weight based on the BMI, the body mass index of a nine foot nine person, we would find out that they weigh between 400 and 600 pounds. And since the human head weighs about 8% of the, I mean, this is all common knowledge, I know. <laughs> this is a 40 to 50 pound head. And David was just a young man. Most scholars believe him to be around the age of 15 years old because he had eight or seven older brothers, of which three were in the battle, and you had to be 20 years old to fight in the battle. So if you did some math, you could find out he might have been around 15. And a 15-year-old carrying around a 50-pound head has got to look odd. And then to carry it to Jerusalem, which was an 18-mile journey from the Valley of Ella, which is where they were, 18 miles he decided to walk, about seven hours if you're not carrying a 50-pound bowling ball with you. And he arrives at Jerusalem, and so you say, what are you up to, David? Now, if you look a little further and deeper, you find out that Jerusalem was not actually a city occupied by the Israelites. Although the land was given to them, Jerusalem, it was inhabited by the enemy. The Jebusites had inhabited the city of Jerusalem. And if you look a little deeper, you find out that David, the very first city he attacked and took when he became king, was that city, Jerusalem. It was as though David had brought the head of Goliath to Jerusalem and stood, he probably would have stood outside the city walls, since that was an enemy city with that head of Goliath, as though to say, I'm sending you a message, Jerusalem. You Jebusites that are inhabiting land that is not yours, you're next. I'm putting you on notice. And today we're gonna be putting the enemy on notice for territory that he has taken, that he has entrenched himself in our land that God has given us. What are these territories? Sometimes the enemy sets up a fortress inside your Christianity, inside your promised land, and he sets up a stronghold, and from that position, he keeps stealing from you. Old belief systems, that addiction that keeps stealing from you, a poverty mindset that keeps stealing from you and keeps you 
poor, a sickness or a disease. Well, I've always had allergies. He sets up these strongholds in territory that God has already given you. It's your promised land. And yet he's set up in there. And I like what David does is he puts the enemy on notice. I'm coming for you. You're next. We are of the kind of faith that knows that the declaration of the message we send puts the enemy on notice. I think about my Jesus. He had just returned from fasting and being in the wilderness for 40 days. He had been returned from being tempted by the tempter. The Bible says he returned in the power of the Spirit, and he walked into the synagogue on the Sabbath, as was his custom. How many know we got to be in church on the Sabbath? On Sunday or Saturday, whenever you decide to come. But once a week, it was his custom. And he came into the synagogue. And the Bible says that he came in the power of the Spirit, and he opened the scroll, and he read in front of everyone this passage, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is Jesus talking, right in front of everyone. And he's announcing himself to be the Messiah as he reads this, by the way. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor, to give sight to the blind, to release the prisoners from prison, to declare the the year of the Lord's favor, to heal the crippled. Come on, somebody. I like what he was doing. He was putting the enemy on notice. He stood up in that place and he said, Satan, I'm coming for you, man. That territory, blindness. Can I just talk to blindness for a second? He said, blindness, I'm coming for you. I'm putting you on notice. You're defeated. I'm putting you on notice, fear. I'm putting you on notice, condemnation and shame. I am tired of my people being crippled. I'm putting you on notice, Satan. I'm coming for you. I'm taking the territory that you have invaded. There's all these places in our lives that have been invaded. And I like what David shows us here is to put the enemy on notice. When you have a great big debt in your life, if you've ever dealt with big debt, and I'm not talking about credit card debt or cars debt. I'm talking about big debt, sometimes like a big house debt. Or in commercial properties, there can be vast sums of money that are owed. And if you want to pay off that debt, you have to send notice to the bank ahead of time. It can be 30-day notice. If the debt's big enough, it might even be a six-month notice to put that bank on notice that you're paying them off and that you're not going to be making them payments anymore. Send me the payoff number because I'm paying you off. How many know that Jesus has paid off the debt that we had? He's paid it in full. And it's time we put the enemy on notice. You've been paid in full. I ain't making payments to you no more. Somebody say amen. It's the same way when you've been working a job you ain't supposed to work at. You've been serving somewhere you ain't supposed to serve. God didn't have that place for you. He's got something better for you. And you find yourself in a new position that God opened up for you, but you got to give that two-week notice to that old job, that old place. We've been, Satan's been trying to bind us and get us to do his work for long enough. We're not working for that kingdom of darkness anymore, somebody say amen. But we're putting him on notice. I'm giving you notice, Satan. I ain't serving in that house anymore. I'm serving the house of God. Can we give the Lord some praise this morning? Come on. If you own a property and somebody's been in there and they're in there illegally, they're trespassing and you put them on notice. Get off this property. Satan has been trespassing on the promised land long enough in your life. He's been trespassing. And what we need to remind him is that he's been bought out. He's been defeated at the cross and we need to give him an eviction notice. Get off the property, Satan. You got no business in here. Christ defeated you at the cross. It's time to wave goodbye. We're putting him on notice this morning. Somebody say amen. Might have looked a little crazy, David, carrying that big old head of Goliath. Standing outside of the city of Jerusalem, I imagine the Israelites might have thought, well, he's a little crazy. What's he doing? Some of the Israelite army, maybe everybody's kind of returning back to their homes. Like, not the guy that beat Goliath. What is he doing with the head still? Why is he standing there outside of Jerusalem? I wonder if the guard, the Jebusites who were in Jerusalem occupying that city, some of them at at the lookout tower, at the watchtower, looking out going, hey, is everything okay? I don't know, I got a little kid out here holding a great big noggin, man. Has he got an army with him? Nah. 
Do we need to be scared? No, nah, definitely not. You know, when you start declaring your victory over the enemy, people might think you look a little odd. Somebody say amen. People might think you look a little strange. You sound a little strange. Not all churches are raising up overcomers and declarers who can say the word of God and see mountains moved. Not everybody's okay with that. And they start to say, what are they doing? Only certain people get to move mountains. Only certain people can really pray. But Jesus raised up a bunch of people who could be just like David. And today in this story, you're the David. And you're looking at those Jebusites in that city God gave you. And you're saying, I'm putting you on notice. And people might think you look a little crazy. But I want you to think about for a second what he brought to the next challenge. He brought the head of Goliath to the next challenge. What we bring with us matters. We approach a new mountain or a new challenge in our life. We approach a new territory that we know it's time for us to take, that God has given us the land, and it's time for us to, to move on and inhabit that land. The city you didn't build and the wells you didn't dig, those are yours. But look what he brought. What we bring to the new challenge matters. He brought the deliverance of God from the last challenge. He brought the faithfulness of God. He brought the salvation of his Lord. He brought, I remember not too long ago, earlier today, when God helped me defeat this giant, God's going to give me you too. Do you see that? When I go to a new challenge in my life, I can look at the mountain and say, be you removed and cast into the sea. But sometimes anxiousness, worry, and fear tries to be there. In my heart, the Bible says that in the heart of the army of the Israelites, there was fear. Even Saul was greatly afraid of Goliath. But David said, calm the hearts of the men. When we bring confidence of the last victory with us, then the doubt from our heart gets removed. Right When I'm readily on the tip of my tongue looking at a new challenge, but I've got my last victory with me, it's easier to look at that new challenge and say, God delivered me from this guy. God's going to deliver me from you. I went to the airport once to go to Africa, and uh, I have to, uh, to get all prepared. I bring food with me because I can't eat the food there, really. And I was going to be there for two weeks. I got a suitcase full of food. I got all the clothes. You prepare all my notes to train pastors and things. I have to think through everything. I got to the airport two hours early to leave for my trip to Uganda. And I realized when I got in line and the, the driver had already dro driven off that I didn't have my passport. And, you know, that's a big flight. You can't just reschedule that. Like, I'll take the next flight, which is like next week. What am I going to do? So I start on the phone, right? I'm calling around. I got to find somebody who could. I finally get a, a, a guy. He's in the car. He was so wonderful. He swung by my house, grabbed the passport, drove it to me. He had it to me within 20 minutes. I still made my flight. Amen. Amen. But I could not get on that flight without my passport. I think too many Christians, they forget to take their passport to the next battle. And the passport that David shows us is he took the salvation and deliverance of his God, my last victory, to my next challenge. So that when I get to that challenge, I'm not afraid, but I got my passport. I'm not sure you can come in here. Oh, yes, I can. I got exactly what I need to come in here. God delivered me last time. He's going to deliver me from you. Do you see that? I think sometimes we show up for battle without carrying the right things with us. We've forgotten something. In Psalm chapter 77... And verse 11, it says this, I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. I will also meditate on your work and talk of your deeds. What's he meditating on? When I meditate, you know, sometimes it's like I'm laying down to go to bed for the night. And a lot of times we binge watch our television shows right up till the moment we close our eyes. But maybe turn something off and lay down and meditate instead. And what do I meditate on? A lot of times as people are falling asleep, they meditate on the wrong things. Falling asleep like, ah, oh, tomorrow's Tuesday. Oh my gosh, that report's due in the boss, I just, the boss, I just, I can't, I can't take, if he says, even, I'm just gonna tell him, I'm just gonna tell him. I, I'm not, you know, I'm not gonna do this anymore. Is my wife snoring right now? She's snoring, are you kidding me? 
Can you, Lord, can you just heal the snoring or whatever's happening right now? Oh, the house payments due this Thursday. I don't know if we got it. I don't, and this is what we meditate on. We meditate on our anxieties. We meditate on our worries. But this is a secret to life. As you're falling asleep, you could meditate instead on the places God gave you a great victory. You could go back in your mind and say, Ah, remember the time when I was short on money, but then God came through, and I'm still here, and I was able to pay that? Do you remember the time when I was discouraged and God gave? Remember the time when I prayed for a healing? Remember the time when you, were, when you were 16 years old and your windshield wipers wouldn't work and it was raining and you couldn't get where you were going and you prayed and suddenly the windshield wipers started working? Do you remember that victory in your life? And so, that actually happened to me. And you remember the victory that God, remember the time you prayed for your daughter and, and they said that she'd have asthma her whole life, but then she got healed of it. Remember the time when you prayed for your son, they said he would never be able to drink dairy, but now he can have milk because you prayed that allergy off. Remember the time when, when it was raining and you couldn't do your crusade? You had traveled, you know, 4,000 miles to do a crusade and it was raining, but then you prayed and God stopped the rain and you were able to do the crusade anyway. Do you remember the victory that God gave you the last time? Remember when the giant stood up and, you, and God delivered you and you chopped off his head? Remember that moment. And you start, to, you start to remember stuff you had forgotten that God had done for you. you. You build yourself. What is he doing? He's meditating on the right kind of things. And even the things of old. Remember the time when Jesus prayed for the leper. Remember the time when Jesus raised the man from the dead. Remember the time when we look at God's word for victory and we meditate on the works of our God. Instead, people, they lay in bed and they remember the wrongs that were done to them. Remember the friend that betrayed me. Or we make a list of all the things we need to change about our spouse. And you remember all the stuff that he did wrong that day and that week and that month and that year and that five years. It's too many things to remember. What if we started remembering the good things? Remember the good thing that God provided you with. Remember the victory. Remember the time when God delivered you. Those are the right kinds of things to be remembering. And so in 2 Samuel chapter 5 and verse 6, it says this, And the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites. Now the king is King David. It's been about 20 years since the moment when he was young and carrying the big head of that giant. It's been some time now, but the time has arrived and the timing is right. He's king, and the very first thing he does is go after that city. He didn't build a house first. He didn't go to get the ark first. There's so many things he could. He didn't. His first thing he did, it's time to go get that city. And he walked out, I imagine, as he approached that city, and he was probably thrust back in his mind to the time when he was just a young boy, and he began to remember the time. I remember when I put you on notice. Jebusites, and I'm coming for you. The Bible says that he came against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who spoke to David, saying, this is what they said, you should, you should not come in here. The blind and the lame will repel you. Like the Jebusites are taunting him, right? They're making fun of him. Coming in here, David's coming in here, give me a break. You don't see that a lot in the Bible, where the, the enemy began to, they begin to taunt him. The enemy taunts you. You ain't taking this land. You're not taking this territory. Who do you think you are? The, the, Bible, the, 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 the Bible says that the Jebusites, if we look at it, had been in that land for a long time. In fact, God told Abraham, I'm giving you the land of the Jebusites, your descendants. So that was a thousand years before this. When Joshua came into the land, of all the land that he took, did you know that he did not get the Jebusites out of Jerusalem at that time? that at no time between Joshua entering and now have the Jebusites ever not been in that city. They'd had it the whole time. 400 years they'd been owning that land. And legend has it that they had even set up two bronze statues in the center of their city. One they named Isaac and the other one they named Jacob. And Jacob, he had a, a hip problem, so they called him the lame. And Isaac, whose eyes were weakened to his old age, they called him the blind. And they would make fun of 
who the forefathers or the ancestors were of the Israelites. They would tell their people, the Israelites will never get in here because they come from the lame and from the blind. And they began to taunt to him, you'll never get in here. Even the lame and the blind could stop you. What were they saying? David, nobody's ever gotten us before. You think you're going to come get us? You'll never get in here. Joshua wasn't able to take us. Caleb wasn't able to take us. The greats, your great soldiers, your great generals never took this territory. Ehud didn't take us. Othniel didn't take us. The great pair, Deborah and Barak, did not take us. Samson couldn't get us. Gideon couldn't get us. You ain't coming in here either. The enemy does the same thing to us. Your forefathers dealt with this. This has been ingrained in you from a, your daddy was broke. Your grandpa was broke. We've owned this territory since you could remember. You'll never get in this land. But I like what David did. I like how David answers this. Let's go to the next verse. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. <laughs> didn't even matter. All their taunting didn't matter. Doesn't sound like there was this great big war or anything. There, when it says Zion, it refers to Zion, but it's referring to Jerusalem. He took the city. He drove the jet, what everyone else couldn't do. He did in his first act as king. Let's go get it. Boom, got it. All right, what's next? You see, the enemy has nothing on you but a lot of taunts and words. It's going to try and make you anxious and fearful. It's going to try and stop you from even trying. Because the enemy knows that once you put them on notice, once you make that declaration, and you carry with you the, the salvation and the deliverance of your God from the last time that he delivered you, and you speak to that thing, he knows he's shaking at his feet. He's already defeated. He's already under your feet. He knows he has to go when you put him on notice. Somebody say amen. It is time for us to stop living below the means that God has provided for us in the promised land. He says, I want you to live here. Here, but you're living down here but it's time to put the enemy on notice I'm living up here where God has called me to live he gave me the land get off my land somebody give the Lord some praise can we just take a moment to give the Lord a praise offering go back just for a second to our hero David when he approached Saul and he told Saul, I'm going to beat that giant Goliath. Let's just kind of rewind in our story a little bit. And when he decided he was going to fight Goliath, it was kind of an interesting scenario because Saul, the king, is looking at this little boy. And this is what Saul, the king, says to David. As David and Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine, the giant Goliath, to fight with him. Remember that all the soldiers were afraid of this guy. And he says, for you're just a kid. You're a youth, and he is a man of war from the time of his youth. This is David's response. Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard. I love that part. I love that part. Like a lion takes your sheep and you're like, hey, 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 come here. Come here. Give me that. Give me I fight with my little dog with a sock sometimes. But this was different because it was a lion. And Give me that. And then the lion was like, oh, no, you didn't, and came after David. He's like, oh, no, you don't. He grabbed it by its beard. Killed it. I don't know what he did. I don't know what he did, but he killed a lion with his hands. Think about it for a second. As he was approaching Goliath, his new challenge, he brought with him the victory of another challenge. I remember when God delivered me from the lion and the bear, this Goliath will be no different. When he came to Jerusalem and saw those Jebusites, I remember when God delivered me from this giant Goliath. He'll do no different with you guys. You guys got to go. He'll give me a victory with you. He brought with him his prior victories. You know what he didn't bring? He didn't bring his defeat with him. Lots of people have defeated moments and discouraging moments. I don't know what David's were, but you know, he grew up a youngest child. He probably got beat up by his brother sometimes. 
He didn't mention that to Saul. He didn't say, Saul was like, well, you can't fight this Goliath guy. I mean, he's too big. And David's like, well, that's true. My older brothers used to kick my butt all the time. He didn't bring his defeat with him. He brought his victory with him. He didn't, bring, he didn't remember the time when he fell. He remembered the time when God was, was, uh, delivered him and showed himself faithful. He let God's faithfulness be the fuel for the next challenge. We could do the same thing in our lives. And I don't know what prepared David for the bear or the lion. I don't know, but maybe there was preparation for that too. Maybe there was a step before defeating the lion and the bear. Maybe there was like a, a rabid llama. <laughs> maybe like a sheep that got rabies. <laughs> it was a biting sheep. Hey, 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 stop that. And he's biting. He's like, oh, killed the sheep, man. God delivered me from the sheep. I don't know what his little victories were, but we can find things where God has moved and delivered us and been our salvation, even in small things. And we can use that as fuel for the next big challenge that we might be facing in our lives. Give the Lord some praise. That's good right there. (laughs) And so what did David do? He stands in front of Goliath and he says this. Goliath taunted him. The taunt comes. What am I, a dog that you'd bring sticks at me? That's what Goliath said. I don't even think that's a good cut down, Goliath. Like, (laughs) you called him a stick. Like, you can come up with something better than that, can't you? But he couldn't. I don't know. Maybe he was nervous. And David says to him this. What, What did he say? Let's pull it up. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. And I will strike you, and I will take your head from you, And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth. What did he do? He just put Goliath on notice. I'm coming for you, man. I got this God with me. You're going to die. And he probably, and that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And think about this. He would have seen that bear carcass and that lion carcass being feasted on by the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. He was drawing upon his past victory to take him into his new victory. We need to learn to remember what God has done for us as we face our next challenge because we're going from glory to glory in this church. I don't know if you know that. There's a new challenge, but we're just remembering the last challenge. When the Israelites came into the promised land, they came to it. They sent in 12 spies And 10 of them came back and said, there's giants in the land. We can't take it. That land that God had given them, they had decided they couldn't get. And in fact, they said, the Bible says that they were voting on a new leader that could lead them back to Egypt. When God is is seeing all this and hearing all this, and only two spies actually said they could go in, which was Joshua and Caleb. But the people had grumbled and they decided to leave. The, the, The Bible teaches that God said, How many miracles do these people have to see before they're going to believe in me? They keep forgetting what I have done. The book of Psalms in chapter 78 describes it as well. They forgot the mighty and marvelous works of God. And so they didn't get to go into the promised land. The problem, one of the problems that they had was they didn't remember the prior victory and take that with them to the new challenge. Do you see that? And because of that, they weren't able to even get into the promised land. So often, I think we get to the new challenge and we forgot to bring God's prior faithfulness with us. So we're just not ready. Psalms 105 says this, if I don't remember your works, O Lord, let you let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. What's he saying? He's saying, don't even let me talk if I'm not remembering the last victory you gave me, O Lord. Don't even let me speak because I'll say something dumb. Amen? We just keep, if the Israelites had just kept their mouth shut, they might have had a better chance than saying all the things that they said when they forgot what God had done in their lives. But not so with us. We are of a people who remember. Numbers chapter 11 and verse 5 says, that the Israelites remembered something. They remembered, it says in Numbers chapter 11, verse 5, we remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt. We ate cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. They remembered good food when they were slaves. Really? 
Why are we remembering the wrong stuff sometimes? Yeah, do you also remember that while you were there, you had no land, you had no inheritance, you had to work all day for somebody else's pyramid? Come on, somebody. And we start to remember the way things used to be as though it was grand, and we forget the things that actually matter, the God who has delivered us and saved us, who parted the Red Sea, who cleansed our sins in the sea of forgetfulness. He set us free from being a slave to sin. He set us free from condemnation. He set us free from shame. He nailed everything to the cross of Calvary. Come on, somebody. Gave us authority, his spirit. He's given us so much. But sometimes we just remember the wrong things. What we take with us to the next challenge. And John chapter 19 and verse 16 tells of our Savior Jesus. And the Bible says this. Then he delivered him to them to be crucified. And so they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of the skull which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. And Goliath's name was Goliath of Goth. And I just imagine that as Jesus got up on that cross, just outside the city of Jerusalem, he was putting the enemy on notice. Just like David did, I imagine Jesus was just like David. David had cut the enemy of his foe off and held it outside of that city of Jerusalem. But as Jesus died on the cross, he fulfilled a prophecy that God had spoke, that Jesus would crush the head of the serpent and that he would bruise his heel. And up on that cross, he had a nail through his heels and what looked like he was the spectacle, what looked like he was defeated, what looked like he was dying. Oh, the enemy did not know that in that moment, Jesus was standing there and he was saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he was putting the enemy in the kingdom of darkness on notice. You're gonna be under my feet. Come on, somebody. I'm putting you on notice. What do I remember when I go to my next challenge? When I go to my next challenge, what do I remember? I remember that at the cross of Calvary, Jesus defeated the foe. That Satan stands broken. He stands beaten. He lost. And that sickness was nailed to that cross. That blindness was nailed to that cross. That poverty and lack was nailed to that cross. That depression that you've been struggling with was nailed to that cross. That low self-esteem that holds you back and steals your confidence was nailed to that cross. Your fears and your doubts and that stronghold that Satan has set up inside your Christianity was nailed to that cross. And today we remember, as we walk to our next challenge, we remember that Jesus defeated the enemy in full. He paid the price. And I look at the challenge of the enemy and I say, you're trespassing on this land. You've been defeated. Vacate the premises immediately. Give the Lord some praise. Woo! Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father God, we thank you for ministering life to us and revelation about this word, that we would meditate on your marvelous works in our life and take those works with us, those miracles with us to the next challenge, to the next city, to the next territory that you have us taking. We thank you, Lord, that you deliver us into that land that you are our salvation and our strength, that we don't do it by our works, but we do it by the declaration of our mouth and by the faith that's in our heart. We thank you and praise you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for tuning in, man. I really, I really hope you enjoyed today. I know you loved it. Yeah. And you, you were talking about putting on Satan on notice. That's right. He's, God's promised you promises. And it might be time for you to draw that line in the sand and put Satan on notice. I'm coming for that territory because it's territory that Jesus has already given you. It's already yours. Just go yeah, get it. That's right. Even though he's occupying it, it's the stuff that God has promised to you. That's right. Hey, we encourage you to be a giver. We know that giving is the best part of life. And so give your tithes to your church. But we encourage you now, you've been blessed today, to be a blessing back. Get online, send in your love offer. It allows us to take this message all over the world. That's right. And, and, and get more word in you. This is a book called Not By Sight. It's a little mini book. I, I love, can't see it. I love mini books. 
It, is that better? How about this? No, I thought it was funny because it's not no, by sight. It's not, you missed the joke. I did miss the joke. It, it was, was a good right one there. too. <laughs> because by we faith. walk by faith and not by sight. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what the circumstances are telling you. This book is going to help reveal that to you more and more. That your reality is not God's reality. And sometimes we have to shut our eyes to our own reality Ooh. so we can take on God's reality. It's called Not By Sight. You can search for it on Amazon. That's where we sell these. Or you can just stop by his house and pick one up. Yeah. I don't know why I said that. I don't know that funny. either. <laughs> <laughs> hey, be blessed. We'll see you next week. And don't forget about Wake Up. Yeah. Don't are, forget about Wake Up. We do, are we you still about watching it. this? Are you, where are you, why, you should have turned it off by now. We do a daily Bible study. They're going to put something on the screen every single day, Monday through Friday. Scripture, morning prayer. You thought this was fun. We have fun. We have fun. Every morning is a whole lot of fun. And uh, so we encourage you to subscribe to it. Be blessed.